Marlissa has a story that she's going to read for us. So just a reminder, if you can keep your mics off so that everybody can hear okay. the story. Uh, okay. Yeah, no problem. Everyone will be able to hear the story then, and then we'll be able to uh, give Marlissa our attention. Hi, everyone. So we're on chapter four of Charlotte's Web, which I started last month. Loneliness. The next day was rainy and dark. Rain fell on the roof of the barn and dripped steadily from the eaves. Rain fell in the barnyard and ran in a crooked what? down into the lane where thistles and pigweed grew. Rain spattered against Mrs. Zuckerman's kitchen windows and came gushing out of the downpour, downspouts. Rain, rain fell on the backs of the sheep as they gazed in the meadow. When the sheep tired of standing in the rain, they slowly they walked slowly up the lane and into the fold. Rain upset Wilbur's plans. Wilbur had planned to go out this day and dig a new hole in his yard. He had other plans too. His plans for the day went something like this. Breakfast at 6.30, slim milk, clusters, piddlings, bits of donuts, wheat cakes with drops of maple syrup sticking to them, potato skins, leftover custard pudding with raisins, and bits of shredded wheat. Breakfast would be finished at seven. From seven to eight, from seven to eight Wilbur planned to have a talk with Templeton, the rat that lived underneath his trough. Talking with Templeton was not the most interesting occupation in the world, but it was better than nothing. From eight to nine, Wilbur planned to take a nap outside in the sun. From nine to 11, he planned to dig a hole or trench and possibly find something good to eat buried in the dirt. From 11 to 12, he planned to stand still and watch flies on the cupboards, watch bees in the clover and watch swallows in the air. 12 o'clock lunchtime, middlings, warm water, apple, berries, apple. berries pears, berries. meat, scraps, still harmony and the wrapper of a package of cheese. Lunch would be over at one. From one to two, Wilbur planned to sleep. From two to three, he planned to scratch itchy places by, by rubbing against the fist. From three to four, he planned to stand perfectly still and think of what it was like to be alive and to wait for firm. At four o'clock, mm. would come supper, slim milk, provided leftover sandwich from Lurby's lunchbox, prune skins, a morsel of this, a bit of that, fried tomatoes, uh, marmalade drippings, a little more of this, a little more of that, and a piece of baked apple, a scrap of upside down cake. Wilbur had gone to sleep thinking about these plans. He woke at six and saw, it, saw the rain, and it seemed as though he couldn't bear it. I get everything all beautifully planned out, and it has to go and rain, he said. For a while, he stood gloomily indoors. Then he walked to the door and looked out, looked out. Drops of rain struck his face. Yard was cold and wet. His trough had an inch of rain water in it. Templeton had nowhere to be seen. Are you out there, Templeton? Asked Wilbur. There was no answer. Suddenly, Wilbur felt lonely and friendliness, friendless. One day, just like another, he groaned. I'm very young. I have no friend here in the barn. It's going to rain all morning and all afternoon. Our friend won't come in such bad weather. Oh, honestly, and Wilbur was crying again for the second time in two days. At 6.30, Wilbur heard the beating of a pail. Lurvy, who was standing outside in the rain, stirred up breakfast. Come on, pig, said Lurvy. Wilbur did not budge. Lurvy jumped the slop scrap in the pail and walked away. He noticed that something was wrong with the pig. Wilbur didn't want food. He wanted love. He wanted a friend, someone who would play with him. He mentioned this to the goose who was sitting, sorry, sorry. sit making, sit marker. Right now I am on my way to your trough to eat your breakfast since you haven't got sense enough to eat it yourself. And Templeton, the rat, crept stressfully along the wall and disappeared into the private tunnel that he had dug between the door and the trough in Wilbur's yard. Templeton was a crafty rat and he had things- Sorry, 
the tunnel was an example of his skill and cunning. The tunnel enabled him to get from the barn to his hiding place under the pig truck without it coming into the pen, into the open. He had tunnels and runways all over. Mr. Zuckerman's farm and could get from one place to another without being seen. Usually he slept during the daytime and was abroad over after dark. Wilbur watched his him disappear into the tunnel in a the moment he saw that rat's sharp nose poked out from underneath the wooden trough. Cautiously, Tim Wilson pulled himself up under the edge of the trough. This was the most more than Wilbur could stand. On the dreary rainy day to see his breakfast being eaten by somebody else, he knew Tumbleton was being soaked out there in the pouring rain, but even that didn't comfort him. Friendless, dejected, and hungry, he threw himself down in manure and sobbed. There in the afternoon, Lorraine went into Zuckerman's, went to Mr. Zuckerman. I think there's something wrong with that pig of yours. He can't even touch his food. Give him two spoons full of sulfur and a little molasses, said Mr. Zuckerman. Wilbur couldn't believe what he was ha what was happening to him. When Lorraine caught him and forced the messenger, and so this was exactly the worst day of his life. He didn't know whether he could endure the awful loneliness anymore. Darkness settled over everything. Soon there were only shadows and the noises of the ship chewing their cords and occasionally the rattle of a cow chained up overhead. He, he, wait, you can imagine Wilbur's surprise when out of One. Okay, where was I? You can imagine Wilbur's surprise when out of the darkness came a small voice he had never heard before. I, it sounded rather than, but pleasant. Do you want a friend, Wilbur? It said. I will be a, a friend to you. I watch you, and all day I like you. But I can't see you, said Wilbur, okay, jumping. Can you guys hear Marlissa? Time is empty. Mind is full. It's always hard to sleep. A dozen times during the night, Wilbur woke and stared into the blackness, listening to the sounds and trying to figure out what it was. A barn is never perfectly quiet. Even at midnight, there's usually something stirring. The next time he woke, he heard Templeton gnawing a hole in the green bin. Templeton's teeth scraped loudly against the wood and made quite a racket. That crazy rat, thought Wil Wilbur. Why does he have to stay up all night grinding his flatters and destroying people's property? Why don't, why can't he go to sleep like any decent animal? The second time Wilbur woke up, he heard the goose turn on her nest and chuckling to herself. What what time is it, whispered Wilbur to the goose. Probably about half past seven, said the goose. Why aren't you asleep, Wilbur? Too many things on my mind, said Wilbur. Well, said the goose. That's not my trouble. I have nothing at all on my mind. Five, too many things under my, behind me. Have you ever tried to sleep while sitting on eight eggs? No, replied Wilbur. I suppose it is uncomfortable. How long does it take? a good egg to hatch. Approximately 30 days all told, answered the goose, but I, I cheat a little. One warm afternoon, I just pull a little straw from, from over the eggs and go out for a walk. Robert yawned and went back to sleep. In his dreams, he heard something, heard something again, the voice saying, I'll be a friend to you. Go to sleep, you'll see me in the morning. About half an hour before dawn, Wilbur woke, at, woke and listened. The barn was still dark. The sheep lay motionless. Even the goose was quiet. Overhead on the main floor, nothing stirred. The cows were resting. The horses dozed. Templeton had quit working and gone off somewhere on an errand. 
The only sound was a slight scraping noise from the rooftop where the weather vane swung back and forth. Wilbur loved the barn when it was like this, calm and quiet, waiting for life. Day is almost over, he thought. Through a small window, a faint gleam appeared. One by one, the stars went out. Wilbur could see the goose a few feet away. She sat with her head tucked under a wing. Then he could see the sheep and the lamb and the slight sky. The beautiful day is, is here at last. Today I shall find my friend. Wilbur looked everywhere. He searched his pen thoroughly. He examined the window ledge, staring up at the ceiling, but he saw nothing. No, finally he decided he would have to speak up. He hated to break the lovely stillness by dawn by using his voice, but he couldn't think of anything other than to look, locate the mysterious new friend who was nowhere to be seen. So Wilbur cleared his throat. Attention, please, he said in a loud, firm voice. Will the party who addressed me at bedtime last night kindly make yourself or herself known by giving an appropriate sign or signal? Wilbur paused and listened. All the animals lifted their heads and stared at him. Wilbur blushed, but he determined to get in touch with this unknown friend. Attention, please, he said. I will, will repeat the message. Will the party who addressed me at bedtime last night kindly speak up? Please tell me where you are if you are my friend. The sheep looked at each other in disgust. Stop your nonsense, Wilbur, said the oldest sheep. If you have disturbing his rest, and the quickest way to spoil a friendship is to wake somebody up in the morning before it, he is ready. How can you be sure your friend is an early riser? I beg everyone's pardon, whispered Wilbur. I didn't mean to be object objectionable. He lay down murkily in the manure facing the door. He did not know it, but his friend was very near. And as old ship was right, the friend was still asleep. Soon, Wilbur appeared with the slop for breakfast. Wilbur rushed out, ate everything in a hurry, and left the trough. As she moved off down the lane, the gander wandered along behind them, pulling the grass. And then, just as Wilbur was sent down for his morning nap, he heard again the thin voice that was addressed him the night before. Salutation, said the voice. Wilbur jumped to his feet. Sal, you what? He cried. Salutation. What are they? And where are you? Screamed Wilbur. Please tell me where you are and what are salutations? Salutations are greetings, said the voice. When I say salutation, it's just my fancy way of saying hello or good morning. Actually, it's a silly expression. And I'm surprised that I used it at all. As for my whereabouts, that's easy. Look up where in the corner of the doorway. Here I am. Look, I'm waving. At last, Wilbur saw the creature and it, it spoke to him in such a kindly way. Stretching across the upper part of the doorway was a big spider web, and hanging from the top of the web head down yeah, was a large gray spider. She was about the size of a gumdrop. She had eight legs and she was waving one of them at Wilbur in friendly greetings. See me now, she asked. Oh, yes, indeed, said Wilbur. Yes, indeed. How are you? Good morning, salutation. Very pleased to meet you. What is your name, please? May I have your name? My name, she said the spider, is Charlotte. Charlotte what? Said, asked Wilbur eagerly. Charlotte A. Cavatia, but just call me Charlotte. I think you're beautiful, said Wilbur. Well, I am pretty, replied Charlotte. There's no denying that. Almost all the spires are rather nice looking. I'm not as flashy as them, but I'll do. I wish I could see you, Wilbur, as clearly as you could see me. Why can't you? Asked the big. I'm right here. Yes, but I'm near, I'm nearsighted, replied Charlotte. I've always been dreadfully nearsighted. It's good to know some it's good in some ways, but not so good in others. Watch me wrap up this fly. I thought that I had been crawling along Wilbur's trough, had grown up and plunged into the lower part of Charlotte's web. 
and tangled it into the sticky threads. The fly was beating its wings fiercely, trying to break loose and free itself. First, Charlotte said, I dive at him, she plunged, head first toward a fly as she dropped a tiny silken thread around, unwound from the rear end. Next, I wrap him up, I grab the fly, throw a few jets of silk around it and roll, it and roll over and wrapping it so it couldn't move. Wilbur watched and horror. He couldn't hardly believe what he was seeing. Although the deserted flies he had was sorry for this one. There's, said Charlie. Now I knock him out so he'll be more comfortable. She bites a fly. He can't feel a thing, she remarked. He'll make a perfect breakfast for me. You mean you eat flies? gasped Wilbur. Certainly. Flies, bugs, grasshoppers. Choice beetles, moths, butterflies, tasty cockroaches, gnats, midgets, daddy long legs, centipedes, mosquitoes, crickets, anything that is careless. In Pleasant, thin voice grew even thinner and more pleasant. Don't say that, groaned Wilbur. Please don't say things like that. Why not? It's true. I have to say that that it's true. I am not really happy about my diet of flies and bugs. That's the way I, I've made. It's where it has to be picked up a living somehow or other. And I happen to be a trapper. I just naturally build a web and trap flies and other insects. My mother was a trapper before me. Her mother was a trapper before her. All our family have been trappers. Right back for thousands and thousands of years, we spirits have been named for flies and bugs. It's a miserable inheritance, said Wilbur groomingly. He said that because his friends was so bloodthirsty. Yes, it is, agreed Charlotte. But I can't help it. I don't know how the first fire in the early days of the well, it happened to think this is the fancy idea of spinning a web, but she did, and it was clever of her too. And since then, all of us buyers have had to work the same trick. It's not a bad, bad pitch or the hole. It's cool, Wil replied Wilbur, who did not intend to be argued out of the disposition. Well, you can't talk, said Charlotte. You have your own meals brought to you in a pail. Nobody feeds me. I have to give my own living. I live by my wits. I have to be sharp and clever. At least I go hungry. I have to think things out, catch what I can, make yeah. that. and it just too happens. And it just so happens, my friend, that what comes to is flies and insects and bugs. And furthermore, said Charlotte, shaking one of her legs, you realize that if I don't catch bugs and eat them, bugs would in seize and multiply get so nu numerous that they don't destroy the earth, wipe out everything? Really, said Wilbur, I wouldn't want that to happen. Perhaps your web is a good thing after all. The goose had been listening to their conversation and clucking to herself. There is a lot of things Wilbur doesn't know about life, she thought. He's really a very in innocent little pig. He doesn't know what's going to happen to him after Christmas, okay, we'll have he has no idea that Mr. Zuckerman and Lurby are planning to kill him. And the goose raised herself a bit and poked her legs a little further under her so they could, so they would receive the full heat from the warm body and soft feathers. Charlotte stood quietly over the fly, preparing to eat it. Wilbur lay down and closed his eyes. He was tired from his wakeful night and from the excitement of meeting someone for the first time, a breeze brought him the smell of clover, the sweet smelling world beyond his fence. Well, he thought, I've got a new friend and right, but what a gamble friendship is. Trot is fierce, brutal, scheming, bloodthirsty, everything I don't like. How can I learn to like her, even though she is pretty and, and of course, clever? Wilbur was merely suffering the doubts and fears that often go with finding a new friend. 
and good times he was to have discovered that he was mistaken about Charlotte. Underneath her blood, blood uh, pearl exterior, she had a kind heart and she was grew loyal and true to the very end. Ooh, chapter six. The early summer days of a farm are the happiest and the fairest of the days. Lilacs bloom that and makes it air, air sweet and then fade. Apple blossoms come with the lilacs and the bees visit around the among the apple trees. The days grow warm and soft. School ends, the children have time to play and to fish for trouts in the brook. Avery often brought a trout home in his pocket, warm and stiff and ready to be fried for supper. Now, after school was over, Fern visited the barn almost every day to sit quietly on her stool. The animals treated her as an equal. The sheep lay calmly at her feet. Around the 1st of July, the workhorses were hitched to the mowing machine, and Mr. Zuckerman climbed into the seat and drove into the field. All morning, you could hear the rattle of the machine. As it went round and round, while the tail grass fell down behind the cutter bar in long green Hosted sweet and warm and to the big lap until the whole farm seemed like a wonderful bed of Timothy and Clover. It was fine to jump in and perfect to hide in, and sometimes Avery would find a little grass snake in the hay and would add it to the other things in his pocket. Early summer days in a jumble time for birds, in the fields around the house, in the barn, in the woods, in the swamp, everywhere love and songs and nests and eggs. From the edge of the woods, the white throated sparrow, which must come all the way from Boston, calls, oh, Peabody, Peabody, Peabody. Oh, apple, bow the phobia teeters and the wags and tails as says, Phoebe, Phoebe, the song sparrow who knows how brief and lovely his life is says. Sweet, 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 intrude, sweet, 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 intrude. If you enter the park, the swallows swamp down from under the net and scold. Cheeky, cheeky, they said. In the summer, there were plenty of things for a child to eat and drink and suck and chew. Dandelion stems are full of milk, clover heads are loaded with nectar. The brigadero is full of ice cold drinks. Everywhere you look, is life. Even the little ball of spit on the weed stalk. If you poke at it, part it has a green worm inside of it and on the other side of the leaf of the potato vine are the bright orange eggs of the potato bug. It was it was on the day in early summer that the goose eggs hatched. This was important bit in the barn cellar. Barn was there sitting on her stone where it happened, except for the goose herself. Charlotte was on the first to know that the gulls she had last arrived. The goose knew a day in advance that they are coming. She could hear their weak voice calling from the inside of the egg. She knew that there were a desperately cramped position inside the shell and were most anxious to break through and get on. So she was quite still and talked less than usual. When the first gosling poked its green Gray green, they head through the goose's feathers and looked around. Charlotte spied it and made an announcement. I am, I am sure, she said, that everyone of us here will be grateful to learn that after four weeks of unremitting efforts, the patient on the part of our friend, the goose, she has, has something to show for it. The gooseling has arrived. May I offer my sincere congratulations. Thank you, thank you, thank you, said the goose, nodding and bowing shamelessly. Thank you, said the gander. Congratulations, shouted Wilbur. How many gosslings are there? I can only see one. There are seven, said the goose. Fine, said Charlie. Seven is a lucky number. 
like he had nothing to do with this, said the goose. It was good management and hard work. At this point, Templeton showed his nose from his hiding place under Wilbur's trough. He glanced at Fern, then he crept cautiously toward the goose, keeping close to the wall. Everyone watched him for the for he was not well liked, not trusted. Look, he said, he began in his sharp voice. You said you have seven goshlings? There are eight eggs. What happened to the other egg? Why didn't it hatch? It's a dead, I guess, said the goose. What are you going to do with it? Continued Templeton. His little round belly eyes fixed on the goose. You can have it, replied the goose. Roll it away and add it to your nasty collection of yours. Templeton had a habit of picking up unusual objects around the farm and storing them in his home. He saved everything. Certainly, 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 said, said the gander. You may have the egg, but I'll tell you one thing, Templeton, if you ever catch one poking, poking, poking your ugly nose around my goslings, I'll give you the worst pounding a rat ever took. And the gander opened the, his strong wings and beat his hand with them to the show his power. He was strong and brave, but the truth is both the goose and the gander were worried that Templeton and the good reason. The rat had no morals, no conscience, no scruples, no consideration, no decency, no milk of real kindness, uh, punctuation, no higher feelings, no friendliness, no anything. He could find a goose if he could get away with it. The goose knew that. Everybody knew that. With the broad spill, the goose pushed the unhatched egg out of the nest. An insurgent company watched in disgust while the rat rolled it away. Even Wilbur, who could eat almost anything, was appalled. A matter wanted to junky old rot egg, muttered. A rat is a rat, said Charlotte. She laughed, took a little laugh, but many friends, if the ancient egg ever breaks, this barn will be untenable. What's that mean, said Wilbur? It means nobody will be able to live in here, here on account of the smell. The raw egg is a regular stink bomb. I don't believe it, snarled Templeton. I know I want I I know what I'm doing. I handle stuff like this all the time. He disappeared into the tunnel, pushing the goose egg in front of him. He pushed and snug till the he succeeded in rolling it into his lair underneath the trough. The afternoon, when the wind had died down and the barnyard was quiet and warm. The great goose led his seven goosings off to the nest and out into the world. Mr. Zuckerman spied then when he came with Wilbur's, Wilbur's supper. Well, hello there, he smiled all over. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven baby goose, now that's, now isn't that lovely. Okay, so I'm in there, you guys. Good job, Marlissa. Thanks, Lance. You're welcome. Thanks for, thanks for reading that. You're welcome. You guys have any questions? You guys could unmute. If not, you guys can hang out and talk for a little bit too, okay? We're gay still, uh... Have you guys ever read Charlotte's Web before? Or is this your first time? I've read it before. Yeah, I haven't read it for a long time. Yeah, same. I was going to say, I haven't heard it since like second grade, maybe. <laughs> it's been a long time. Yeah, it's been a while for me, too. I remember there's a spider, and that's about it. <laughs> that's Charlotte. And she has a web. <laughs> You're not wrong. I know I'm not. That's why I said it. There's a ray. What are you doing, Shannon? What am I doing? I just finished um, my files for the day. And then I think Chico and I are going to take a walk after this. Oh. What are you doing? Have you moved into your new place, Shannon? 
No, I haven't found a place yet. The other place I was looking at didn't work out, so now I'm back to searching. Bummer. Sorry about that. It's okay. It's gonna happen. We have optimistic thoughts. Yeah, we'll get it. What yeah. happened? Uh, Marlissa asked if I moved into my new place yet, and I was like, no, I gotta find a place now. <laughs> you got what? I still, I'm on the search. Oh. Yeah. Me too, man. Yeah. Hashtag me too. You liar. Not me. <laughs> Manny's <laughs> like, <laughs> I go left with that. <laughs> Manny likes my jokes, right, Manny? Yeah. All right. You don't have to lie to him, Manny. It's okay. <laughs> Manny loves me. He loves my classes. He loves my jokes. He loves my nonsense. I like your classes when you don't make you do squats. Uh, were you in class this morning? No, you weren't, huh? No, I was doing deliveries. Oh. Squat. We were writing stuff on papers. Very diligent. Yeah. We were very busy this morning. Very busy. <sighs> really? Yeah, it was so much work. Wow. There you go. Uh, McGraw. Yeah. What's up, Amy? Do you like chocolate or do you does does Kim like chocolate or no? Do I like chocolate or does Kim like chocolate? Because that's probably two different answers. Does Kim like chocolate or no? Probably. I don't what, know. Kind of what kind of what kind of chocolate does Kim? Hey. Remember me? Who, yeah. Who? Oh, John, I'll, I'll spotlight Andres. This is him. Oh, hi. Hi, Sean. How are you? I'm I'm okay. Oh, I've been good. doing all right. So are, you good? are we done with the lesson? Yeah. Yeah, we, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm glad that I'm on this because, because I need to be on it. So that way I'm not missing out, you know. Oh, uh, okay. We're kind of fun too. sometimes. Uh, yeah. uh, it's fun over here. You guys, sorry I, um, sorry I missed the classes because I was kind of busy. <laughs> was Jamin drinking? Jamin doing something. Wow. What? Uh, okay. You, drifting. Am I what? Drifting. Like yeah. Yeah, I'm just about to drift the bus right now. Yeah. Don't hit the fence, Jamin. You know. What's up, first. Jamin? What's up, Jamin? What's up, Jamin? What's up, oh, you're in Modesto? Yeah, I'm showing uh, my father-in-law is interested in in the bus. Bus number two for sale, so. Oh. Bus number two? Get it yeah. out of here. The old pull-the-door open bus? He should yeah. make it a party bus. Party. Uh, I think so. Either that or a camper. Ooh, that's smart. Ooh. That one would be a good one because that's like the most widest one, I think. Well, then I said it would be cool if they did like if they made a bed to where the lift is and oh you were God. able to fold out like like a fold out bed and then you could turn it into like a tent almost. Oh, oh I, I see, I see, be, I see. You know? Oh. I see the vision. Wow. Like I saw one. I see the one. <laughs> <laughs> um is it okay if um if um if i log uh, off because i gotta go use the restroom yeah yes, that's we're all about to leave. yeah we're gonna close out right now all right okay bye, 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 bye. 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 bye everybody have bye, a good bye. Bye, bye. Bye. bye bye lance bye bye lance <laughs> bye. Oh, bye. 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 Okay, bye guys. Love y'all. Good job, Marlissa. <laughs>